Coming up today on Issues in Education, the world of music education is changing. After 100 years at Florida State University, a new era begins for the College of Music. Welcome to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith, alongside my co-host, the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron. Today we're talking to two men who are playing a major role in the future of FSU College of Music. First, the Dean of the College, Dr. Don Gibson. Also here today is Albert H. Cohen. Mr. Cohen is not only a well-respected music critic, but his recent donation to the college has created the new Albert H. Cohen Endowed Fund for Excellence in Baroque Music Performance and Scholarship. Thank you both for joining us today. So, Al, what came first, an idea that you really wanted to support a music program at a university or an interest in Florida State University's music program? I, it was the first that came first. I decided that I wanted to help with the education of music students in Baroque music, which is a great passion of mine. The problem was how to do this. Then I discovered rediscovered actually the wonderful program at Florida State and after discussions with Dean Gibson it became clear this was the place for me. I love the story of how you rediscovered Florida State University's College of Music. Tell us tell us about this and first let's set this up you, you discovered it at a festival correct? Right. Dr. Gibson tell us what this f festival was all about. Well it was uh, last year last October I believe uh, the Ringling International Arts Festival um, and again, this year, I believe FSU is playing a major role in that. But last year, uh, our College of Music was fortunate to have been chosen to open uh, the entire festival. Our uh, University Symphony Orchestra, in fact, was the uh, group selected to perform. And the uh, maestro, in this case, was uh, Robert Spano, who was the music director of the Atlanta Symphony. So from my perspective, it was an absolutely terrific opportunity for our students to work with a um, really a world-renowned conductor and uh, get under uh, the kind of pressure that you get under in that kind of circumstance. So we were down there essentially. Um, Leo Welsh, Associate Dean and I went down there to support our students and to hear this performance uh, which featured uh, Beethoven's Fifth uh, as well as the Piano Concerto. So Al, w why did you go to this festival? Did you, did you seek out the music performance? Yes, I, uh, we had tickets for um, a half a dozen music and dance events uh, in the festival is normally we go to art things. We are in Sarasota, which is a wonderful place for art and music. And um, we were outside at the reception, and it was warm, so we came into the museum literally to cool off. And I walked in, and I heard strings playing. So I gravitated towards the strings, and I found a string quartet playing a Beethoven quartet. I sat down, and I was listening. Dean Welch saw me listening, an actual rarity apparently from the strollers <laughs> and uh, sat down next to me and we started talking and that's how it started. And then you saw the main performance shortly after that. Yes. Uh, Robert Spano conducted, I'm familiar with his work uh, actually from his early days when he was an assistant conductor I think in Boston and um, I was taken with the ferocity of the performance. It was it w he attacked the music as I like Beethoven to be to be performed, and the musicians were with him. Uh, it was exciting, invigorating, and very good. Let's take a moment to hear the University Symphony Orchestra playing Beethoven's Fifth from a few years ago, before way before last October, and without Mr. Spano as the conductor. Uh, let's take a listen to the University Symphony Orchestra in Ruby, Di the old Ruby Diamond Auditorium <laughs> in 2007.
amazing music from the University Symphony Orchestra back in 2007, and I imagine they were even better than that mm -hmm. when you heard them that night. Mm -hmm. It's hard to compare performances, <laughs> okay? It was really good when I heard mm -hmm. them. You know, I've, I've listened to you, had the pleasure of, of chatting with you many, many times now, and I, I listened to you, and I would have had to make a bet that music was in your educational background, that this was a direction your career had taken. I've got it completely wrong, don't I? Partially wrong. <laughs> I actually was a scientist by education, but I detoured along with my BS in chemistry to get a BA in music history because the two sides of my brain always seem to have a, a co-equal existence. Mm -hmm. But then my graduate study was in science, was in chemistry, and my career was in science and engineering. Well, you also mm -hmm. had a second career in, in mus as, a, as a music critic as well. For, for 18 years, yeah, you wrote articles and... and longer, and, actually. Uh, oh, longer actually, than that. I'm still writing, actually, although not a full-time schedule. I was a full-time critic for 26 years, of which about half of those I was also a full-time chief executive officer of my company. Uh, I still write occasionally. For, for um, actually, lately I've been writing for a Spanish language opera magazine in Mexico City, covering the opera in, in uh, Sarasota and in Santa Fe. Hmm. That's so interesting. And, and at what point did classical music attract you and Baroque music? Classical music started uh, for me in high school, actually. It wasn't an early acquisition. Uh, it came because I was fortunate enough to live in New York City, which had two full-time classical radio stations at the time, a public station, WNYC, and uh, the New York Times classical station, WQXR. And I started listening, and I was hooked. It's as simple as that. Then the big breakthrough came when I heard my school orchestra re rehearsing. And I heard the music as I was walking out of the school late one afternoon, and then it stopped, and the conductor started screaming at the kids. So I popped my head in the door, and I noticed that the soloist was a student that I knew. So I sat in on the rehearsal, and they had just started the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. So I hung around that day, and I came back for the next week or so while the piece became a, a, a concerto. After that, I was totally hooked. Did you ever play an instrument or nope. Nope. never? Nope. No training, no skill. If I have a gift, it's in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say music has transformed your life over the years? That's a very profound question, and it's had a profound effect on me. Uh, in brief, music was always a place which took me away from what I'll call the temporal uh, aggravations of life. But more importantly, in the early 80s, I decided to invest a good portion of my life in listening to all the music of Bach, all the instrumental music, the sonatas, the trio sonatas, the concertos, the suites. And in that excursion, which took me three years, I think my life changed. It gave me a sense of perspective on what really is magnificent and important in life and what's really the kind of ordinary aggravations we allow ourselves to indulge in. And what, and what came out of that was a change of my life, I actually. I, left my, I retired early from my company, devoting myself to study and music. So, so here we go from the possibility that, that your philanthropy could be focused on chemistry or could have been focused on the outcomes of your, um, your, your career and business life. And you describe this transformation, and so you know that you're going to um, you're going to make a gift to help uh, a music program have an enduring component of, of scholarship and and education. So, you met the folks at FSU. Did you go back and start to research in detail what's going on in this program? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> like a good businessman. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be reckless. I, I, uh, if I may back you up a second. Yeah. There was no thought of philanthropy in the sciences for the simple reason that philanthropy is a subject that only arrived on my, in my, on my doorstep in the last five years when I had a 
been successful enough to accumulate enough wealth so that I could think about leaving some money to someone and it wasn't all going to my children so it had to go somewhere important to me. By then music was the most important thing to me. I had known of FSU's music school for many, many years, always considered it was high. In fact, I'd, know, I'd known about it from the days when uh, Dothnyani was uh, a presence here, and it was always a, a place that I thought was a, a very worthwhile place. I'm a full-time Florida resident now for six years, so that would be the state I would want to be, be focused on. When you put those two together, FSU was the obvious and only choice to me. So now if we turn this corner, what's the impact of this gift on the College of Music, Don? Uh, it uh, will be truly transformational for us. Uh, when Al and I began talking about this, um, and as we wandered through the various conversations, which was a very interesting thing in itself, I think it's fair to say, Al. Yes. Um, but in going through those conversations, um, I was explaining to Al that uh, the way things happen in the College of Music, and the way things happen in our college is, has very little to do with the curriculum and requirements and all that kind of stuff. In fact, it has almost nothing to do with that. The students are there, they complete the requirements, they do the curriculum, and they move on. But that's not really what the College of Music is about. The College of Music is about uh, inspirational musical moments and activities that draw students into them. You can see this in our college in the various um, world music ensembles we have the change every year depending on who's around, but at any one time we could have a Chinese ensemble, a Korean ensemble, a Balinese gamelan, uh, African drumming, and so forth. So if we have somebody who can do that, and, and we've been fortunate enough over the years to have a collection of graduate students from those countries, in some cases, who in fact are uh, national treasures of their countries, and they create the kind of artistic energy and presence that draws students to them. And I was explaining to Al that what a gift like this can do is it can help seed the environment. And by ensuring that we have the right kind of faculty leadership and the right kind of performing opportunities, the students will go there. Mm -hmm. And they'll go there because they're deeply interested and they're engaged musically. And when that happens, and when we have other people there that can uh, expand around that experience and enhance it with various kinds of academic uh, knowledge that uh, will enrich them even further, then we have a very, very lively environment. And what this gift will do, uh, and the scope of this gift, it will touch the entire program. Mm -hmm. Our students, all of our students, perform this music. I, I mean, I would include the jazz students who wouldn't naturally have this as part of their curriculum, but they all are participating across the program. So it will touch everybody, and it will carry that conversation in our College of Music to uh, something beyond a world-class level. What would you like to see happen to the uh, Baroque music program here? What, what do you hope they will, what areas do you hope they will grow in that? I would like to see, uh, everyone studies Baroque. Bach is, Bach is basic you know, to all the study of music. But I would like to see that music become more, if I can use the cliche, more mainstream. Um, I would like to to see it broadened out. Uh, Dean Gibson convinced me that Bach was too narrow a focus, and I, I've come to uh, realize he was right, as usual, um, <laughs> that, that Bach was too narrow. Um, I've, recent, I've continued my own excursion, and I've recently, for example, learned about the fabulous violin concertos of Locatelli. Well, I think these students might never have a chance mm -hmm. to invest the time to learn those concertos, and once they do, it might excite and teach them something that they never realized was possible, how innovative and how creative music was inside the narrow rules that the Baroque period required. Hmm. You know, one of the other things that I think that's so interesting about what you've, what you've done is that you've focused on performance and on scholarship, on undergraduates and graduate students. The breadth of that is unusual. It, did you have a thought in mind of why it is that the scope is, is that large? Well, it, those are two legs of the stool, and the third one, mm -hmm. of course, is the composer. Mm -hmm. you can, without the scholarship, the performance will never be informed. Without the mm -hmm. training and performance practice, 
the music will never be will mm -hmm. never will never sound right. They have to go together in my mind. How important is this, um, Dean Gibson, uh, that to the college and to the university that people like Mr. Cohen donate to the programs that that they believe in? Well, it's critically important. Uh, one of the things um, that I think is worthy to note here is that. Um, and when I first went down and met Al, it was a wonderful meeting, but at the end I uh, told him as he was thinking about this to, to be aware of the fact that it was important to me personally that we um, structure any gift in such a way so that it, it bears the name of the donor. Now I told this to Al at that point because I knew that he was not in it to get his name out there. And it wasn't until I explained to him that um, that we do not for the donor, we do it for the students because our business when it runs the best is fueled by that kind of support uh, from people who simply are there because they love it they want to be part of the experience of helping the students learn um, the very best programs have huge amounts of support from the outside and part of the education of our students and what's critical for them to understand is that is the way it works and that there are actually real people behind these names and so forth and uh, we have a, an event every year in the College of Music which is specifically designed to bring donors and the students supported by those donors together to celebrate one uh, luncheon and one afternoon uh, high academic and musical achievement. And the fascinating thing about that, the first year we did it, we'll be into our sixth year now, uh, was not the donors. We knew they'd be delighted and they were very, very happy. But it was the students who came up to many of them came up and said, we just had we just never really thought about never it. Never knew. We just never really knew. Mm -hmm. So um, that is uh, an interesting uh, sidelight to the conversation, but it, in many ways it's critically important. And every time something like this happens, and so that's why Al's gift to us goes well beyond uh, the magnificence of what he's done. It, it creates a model for others uh, to follow. You know, I know that the music program is the third largest, and you might say a word about what that means, but how good are you? We had um, uh, an external evaluation done three years ago that put our program somewhere between number five and eight among comprehensive programs in the United States. Uh, there are some areas in our College of Music where we have no peer. Uh, in the research areas of music education, music therapy, we are without a question number one. Uh, in Science Magazine, in fact, uh, found that we were number three in research among all music programs in the United States. Uh, and we have uh, world-class performers and world-class performance faculty too. So there's a huge international impact to this program. Uh, and has been that way for many, many years. And um, we're fortunate to have enough sec success going out the door that it fuels and brings in new students every year that are capable of continuing the tradition. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty good, Eric. Mm. I hope that you're hearing this. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I definitely am. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We've been talking with the music <laughs> philanthropist Albert H. Cohen and Dean Don Gibson about the FSU College of Music. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Dr. Barron and I will talk one on one about more issues in education. This is not a university presidency, this is the opportunity to take the Florida State University to the next level. We're attracting a student body that can go off and do great things. I like to get the job done. That's really what I'm about. Welcome back to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith, sitting with Dr. Eric Barron, the president of the Florida State University. Dr. Barron, how important is it that, to the university that people like Mr. Cohen donate? Well, I'll tell you, quite frankly, I am going to brag about him everywhere I go. <laughs> and the reason is, is really very simple. 
he's giving some giving to something that he is passionate about and he looked for a program that had the quality that he knew that his gift would not only have an impact on an excellent program it would take it to the next level and I think when people are giving with that level of passion because he's not one of our alumni he's someone trying to support the quality of music programs that's really something to brag about is is that unusual that people like the people who aren't alumni donate to programs like that well a significant amount of giving does come from uh, from non-alumni I would say that the biggest is for medical schools because of the impact that medical schools have on an individual's health during certain circumstances um, and the arts are are similar in that way but he was doing research he was making sure that it wasn't just tying to something there he was tying it to what he felt was a quality program and and that makes a huge difference how is fundraising going for the university right now well last year was a good year uh, the the giving to higher education was down three percent across the nation uh, our academic fundraising was up thirty two percent I think we're already over twice what we were at this time last year there's starting to be a lot of energy uh, focused on this topic and I think we have such a supportive alumni base and an arts community out there that realizes how important the arts are to Florida State I think we're going to build a momentum for something quite exciting. Well, 2011, you're going to be launching the next capital ca campaign for the university. Yes. What are your goals for that? Well, I think initially the, the idea was we should raise a billion dollars. But you know something? A billion dollars is a lot of zeros. I'm not actually afraid of the zeros. I, I just like the notion that people would say a billion dollars, they're trying to get the number and then it's over when really we should be looking at all of the things we need to be a great university and we should be raising that amount of money that's the kind of love our alumni have for this university so I'm I believe that when we do the addition the number will be more than a billion dollars what kind of things um, or how are you finding out what the university needs to to become the great university that, that you envision. Oh, okay, so some things are really quite obvious. The salaries we're paying our faculty are not good enough. They're not high enough. Uh, we don't want to be where faculty come, learn what a great university is all about, and then go someplace else to get a higher salary. So we need to take a gifted set of faculty and reward them in a way that's competitive with the nation. And so that means things like endowed chairs and professorships and endowments for, that are fellows, fellowships for, uh, for our junior faculty and to support graduate education. So a lot of those things are, are things that it's just obvious that we need to do it, do those types of things. But the other thing that you see is that we've been through a period of, of contraction because state budgets have been so tight. And what that means is you're not investing in the innovative enterprises and the creative enterprises, and we need to renew that investment. And so one of the things we're doing is we've asked all the deans and we've asked all the faculty and staff, give us your big ideas. What are the things that would be transformative for Florida State University? And are you going to take them all into consideration, or are you going to choose from that group? How is that going to work? So one of the things that we want to do is to have all the deans present their big ideas to all the other deans. And does this get people's juices flowing? Do we see all of a sudden that uh, perhaps uh, aging is something for which this university has so many different components across so many different parts of the university, that if we found a way to weave those threads, we would have something that was stronger than any other program in the nation. So we want to look for those things where there's synergism, but we also want to look for those ideas that just sort of stand out and allow a college, or more than one college, to take that next step forward. Now you had mentioned the, the shrinking of state funds, is, and that's most likely the reason why private funding is so important, but how much of what goes into the university is state funded and how much is from private funds? Okay, so. 
Um, just to give you some framework, we have about a, a $1.25 billion budget. Now, you can start taking away pieces. So our athletic program, uh, that has to be self-supporting. And fundraising contributes to that. Um, about $28 million a year uh, worth. Things like residence halls and food services are exactly the cost that it, it takes to deliver them to the students. And then so we're, we're taking this piece down there and we have about $245 million that comes from the state as an allocation. We have a tuition component and right now our academic foundation is returning uh, between 30 and 35 million dollars into, um, into the, the academic uh, success of, of the university. Our endowment ranks 135th in the nation for universities. So that endowment should at least be doubled or tripled. And now you start to imagine the impact of that philanthropy. If you had an endowment that was double or triple, and now all of a sudden you were adding an extra $60 million into the academic success of the university, you'd have something spectacular. We can't have a conversation today about, with, about the College of Music without asking one question at least about Ruby Diamond Auditorium. It's yes. been reopened. What do you think of it? It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I mean, it, this, the space is visually appealing. The sound to my ear is wonderful. Uh, it's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. That's our time for now. Please join us again next month for more Issues in Education. You can watch the premiere episode of Issues in Education the first Wednesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. That means you can see the next new episode on Wednesday, December 1st on WFSU-TV. Join us as we discuss the latest developments in higher education happening around the state and across the country. If you have questions that you would like us to address on this program, you can email us at issues at wfsu.org. Again, that's issues at wfsu.org. If you would like to see past episodes of Issues in Education, head to the President's website at president.fsu.edu. I'm Suzanne Smith with the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron, for Issues in Education. We'll see you next time. Thank you. <sighs> Almost